Zero is what's being talked about, and that's the day when water doesn't come out of the taps in the Western Cape, Cape Town in particular. Uh, the city is scrambling and struggling to try and uh, manage uh, a three-year-long drought situation there. And as we were saying, day zero seems to be on the horizon now. To uh, help us discuss this, we're now joined by Professor Anthony Turton, who's uh, back on the line. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, sorry about the connection earlier on and my first question to you earlier was the crisis that's unfolding in the Western Cape in particular we'll look at the country in general just now how much of it is a natural disaster and how much of it was perhaps poor preparation well in my professional opinion it is not a natural disaster at all it's entirely a man-made disaster because uh, the information that has been available to the scientific community has suggested that this is going to happen for some time now, and it's simply been ignored. But, of course, while we're looking at the uh, Western Cape at the moment, exactly the same thing is about to happen in the Eastern Cape. Uh, you know, East London and Port Elizabeth are not very far behind, and parts of KZN are also not very far behind. So it is, it is not just a local uh, 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 problem, and it's entirely man-made because it's a failure by government at whatever level, whether it's national or whether it's, uh, it's, it's uh, municipal. It's a, a failure of government to, uh, to adequately plan. That's their, that's their primary role. What could they have done differently? You know, I've just been uh, um, shown a newspaper article that came out, I think, in 1989 or 1990 that predicted exactly what is happening today. Now, that's just a newspaper article. In the scientific community, which has been known about since 2002, the National Water Resource Strategy, that's an official document that was published in, uh, to all, all, all water sector professionals got that document, and that predicted three water management areas that would be in, uh, in, uh, in crisis uh, by 2025, one of them being the Bird River Water Management area, and if my memory serves me, it was predicted to have a, a deficit of, uh, of about 500 and, uh, 508 million cubic meters per year. Uh, um, the Invortiums and Kulu uh, water management area, which is essentially KZN, which is uh, predicted to have a deficit of 788 million cubic meters per year, and the Upper Vol, which supplies Gauteng, which is predicted to, to be about 750-odd million cubic meters per year. So this has been known about uh, you know, since then, and uh, it just has not been taken seriously by various people, and uh, you know, one, one, one is left uh, almost dumbfounded uh, as to try and understand how this has actually happened, but the, the fact is, it's upon us now, so we, now's not the time to point fingers, now's the time to actually try and save life in them. So what can be done now that uh, day zero is on the horizon? Is there anything that can be done? Well, we always live in hope, you know, and uh, hope is something that we must never lose sight of. Um, I think uh, the, the, the planning that has been rolled out, as flawed as it is, I'm afraid is the best that there is. And what surprises me today is uh, that uh, the, uh, the uh, Cape Town uh, uh, leadership has just um, uh, purged themselves of the mayor and they've appointed the deputy mayor, who uh, went on, uh, on TV today in his first interview that I'm aware of. And I'm just, dumb, I'm just dumbfounded at how ill-prepared that individual was. You know, you only get one chance to make a, make a good first impression. And I'm afraid to say in this, uh, in this uh, situation where people are just so concerned or, you know, so fearful, and he has a person that comes on, on, on TV uh, in an interview and, and just uh, deflects all the answers and just doesn't know any of the answers. So I'm afraid to say there's not very much uh, uh, a clear, coherent planning there, and this has to be done very, very urgently. It's my understanding that the uh, provincial leadership now is taking this, uh, the reins, and I can only hope that they're really going to come out very strong with a plan, because right now uh, the plan that there is, I'm afraid, is, is, is not very well thought through. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you and it sounds like you've got a really good grasp on, 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 on you know, these situations. And I'm wondering where, where your voice, have you been trying to talk to the authorities before and warning them and saying to them, listen, this is, this is what we need to do and we need to do it urgently. And has it been falling on deaf ears? You know, I, I used to be a fellow at the CSIR. I was the deputy chairman of the, of the research advisory panel, the RAP, uh, 
that was the highest authority in the CSR looking at all the, the national research agenda and overseeing all the parliamentary money. And uh, from that, uh, that period of time, it was quite clear that, uh, that government were in general were just simply not listening to science to the extent that we launched an internal project at that point in time that eventually resulted in, a, in us publishing a book uh, uh, called Governance as a Trialogue, uh, Government, Society and Science in Transition. And that was really an attempt to say that if government is not listening to science and there's, and there, and there's massive issues facing society, then maybe government will listen to the people, therefore science must talk to the people. And that then uh, set me on a, a pathway which eventually led to my suspension from the CSR simply for talking about these very same issues. So the, the, there's a great personal price to pay. I don't want to make a martyr of myself in the process, but there's a great personal price to pay. And uh, many scientists have either just been cowered into, into submission or you know, they, they, they've been threatened in one way or another, so they just simply remain silent. The facts are our friends. We must not be afraid of facts. And if we get back to the Cape Town situation now, the planning as flawed as it is, uh, is based on some factual evidence. And we've tried our very, very best to get the, the, the reports out in public domain, uh, just to at least do some kind of peer review. And uh, we've been blocked. We've been blocked by DDA. They will not make those reports available. So we currently have a prior application in. Uh, because, you know, if facts are friends, and if those reports on which these massive decisions have been made uh, are, are, are technically robust enough, then they will stand up to public scrutiny and we will get a restoration of public confidence. Right now, people are spending millions of rand on this drilling bonanza, uh, and uh, millions and millions of rand are going to drill this, and there's absolutely no indication what the actual cost of drilling is going to be or whether there is even enough water in those aquifers beyond hype. So I'm afraid you know, we've got to really insist now that in the national interest, uh, the, the, the uh, Western Cape, uh, uh, provincial government comes clean, but in particular the municipality of Cape Town, they must make those reports available because in the absence of those reports in the public domain, there's going to be growing uncertainty. It's in the national interest that we start turning the ship around and start uh, rebuilding confidence before panic sets in across the board. And in neighboring Eastern Cape, um, this situation seems to be unfolding there. Tell us about that and what we need to do immediately. Well, I think, I think what we need to do is we need to have good, honest uh, reporting. And I, I must confess, we are having very good, uh, good journalists uh, you know, that present a balanced and technically uh, uh, robust uh, argument. These arguments are terribly complicated. So to try and, and make them understandable to a non-technical person is always a challenge. So, so journalists in general are doing a very, very good job, and we need to, I think, have more access to journalists on a regular basis because right now the communication coming from the political leadership on both sides, when they do communicate, all they're doing is they're deflecting blame from, from, from one party to the other, from, from national to provincial and back, or national to, to, to municipal. This is not helping anybody at all. When the dust is settled, we're about to decide who did what to whom and who is liable. Right now, we have to save life and limb. And right now, we have to prevent this enormous, uh, uh, unfolding uh, human catastrophe uh, that's going to go down in the annals of history, not only as a Cape Town problem, but actually as a failure of the state, as a failure of the national government to, 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 to deliver one of its primary functions, which is about water. Water and wireless is happening in the water sector, the same thing about energy. So these two things are running in parallel, uh, and this is an absolute uh, disaster waiting to happen. Professor Turton, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you very much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts and your insights with us tonight, and I have a feeling uh, we'll be talking to you again uh, in the very near future. That was uh, Professor Anthony Turton, a Walker expert, saying that uh, uh, you know people really, really have to get involved, and the government has to come clean and uh, share uh, the reports that uh, seemingly uh, they are keeping close to their chest. Uh, we'll try and get a response from them and uh, see what they say. Uh, about uh, those allegations.